Welcome to News from Underground, your place and source for consistent anarchist news out there on the internet. Uh, today we're we'll going to talk about an interesting special announcement. Uh, well, kind of covering something we kind of talked about before and the uh, situation going on in Oregon. Apparently, Ammon Bundy was arrested and his friend Lavoy Finnecum died during a shootout with the FBI. Uh, these sort of things are always kind of weird to say, only, like, you know, was he just, was he killed or was he murdered? Right. And whenever it involves the state, the state is always the person to first aggress against people. And I think by uh, by shootout, they mean the FBI shot and they got out of the car. Right, yeah. <laughs> uh, they were saying that uh, reportedly these people came out with their hands up. Uh, and right now, they don't know whether or not uh, what, you know, who shot first. I was like, no, come on, right? Yeah, well, who shot first? Right. <laughs> <laughs> I heard the, uh, the um, hands up was being disputed whether or not he was actually holding his hands up. But yeah, I, I would imagine, I, I imagine the story is incomplete there. I, mm -hmm. I don't necessarily believe that. Yeah. yeah. It's like Michael Brown. It, right. You know, that was total bull. Police extortion is always going to be uh, disputing whether or not your hands are up in the air or not, or whether it was a danger to the life or not. <laughs> yeah. uh, so apparently what, what kind of disturbs me about this is that they've, they've actually been leaving the compound repeatedly several times uh, for snacks and meeting and talking with other people. Uh, so I'm like thinking, it's like, look, you, you know, you're in, a, you're in a hole here. Like, they're surrounded. There's a lot of state agents here who want to hurt you. Mm -hmm. What are you doing leaving the compound to, you know, go for a stroll around the local city? Well, I guess according to uh, what we were covering uh, on a previous news from the underground, they're not getting a lot of support from the surrounding. Right, yeah, okay. Uh, <laughs> they're getting a lot of uh, toys. Right. <laughs> <laughs> And lube from the... Uh, Cars the, Against yeah. Humanity uh, founder, yeah. <laughs> a big and, pearl. You know, I used, to, I used to make fun of them for their lack of preparation until I had to walk to 7-Eleven in a blizzard, so... Right. <laughs> uh, so, yeah, I mean, that's that just happened. Uh, a lot of the details will come out over time, and then we'll probably do a good, you know, wrap-up story of what happened. Um, but, yeah, that just happened just the other day, and uh, I guess we'll stay tuned and see what develops after that, you know. I guess some of the vocal speakers are, are been captured already, and so what does that leave with the rest of the group that are kind of left behind? Are they going to stick it out? Um, I don't know. I guess we'll see as it develops. Yeah. That'll be an interesting one to follow. All right. Well, so today's first story, Ann Arbor area responds to Flint water crisis in a big way. An incredibly large amount of bottled water is headed to Flint thanks to the generous donations of Washtenaw County residents. So this is a, um, a, a, a something that, uh, that was, that's done by the Ann Arbor, the residents of Ann Arbor, is a whole lot of people, and actually surrounding residents and, and, and uh, you know, even beyond, a whole lot of people are donating money and uh, to go, for, go towards bottled water. For the residents of Flint, Michigan, because we know the uh, Flint, Michigan, had, uh, Michigan has had a serious water crisis with um, just I, I don't know if it was actually lead. What was it lead in their water? From what I understand, in 2014, for whatever reason, they had to use water from the Flint River to um, public, I mean, our private homes. Um, so as the local university found out, this water was highly corrosive and ended up doing damage to all the pipes in Flint, Michigan, um, you know, leaching lead and other contaminants into every home. Hmm. Right. So it can, uh, it can corrode the pipes, but it's perfectly safe for your esophagus. <laughs> but, uh, what yeah. was that joke? Oh, it was a, a meme being shared on Facebook is that uh, the government's filling people with lead and it showed uh, <laughs> the Bundy fellow as well as the Flint residents. Well, <laughs> when it comes down to it, that's really all they know how to do. Right. So, um, but the, so, so it, you have this situation and, and what, what sort of brought this forth was just purely cynical money saving, you know, with, with, uh, with governments and government contractors. And, um, but, uh, but, you know, this is a good news story. What, what's happening is that a whole lot of people are getting together. Uh, the, the people from, um, uh, I, I forget what they were called. They're the Washtenaw Water Drive Coalition. They actually put together a GoFundMe page and they've already, they've gotten like $12,000 in this GoFundMe page and GoFundMe itself has put together a contest for 
who can um, build up, and I, I don't even think this is specifically based on their, their website, but they have stated that they will, um, as, as a company, donate $10,000 to the highest grossing um, crowdfunding campaign for, um, for donating water to the Flint citizens. That's a temporary fix, but I'd love to see people donating for maybe a private water supplier, one that actually does uh, distillation or at least reverse osmosis, because I'm sure right. the public water that these people were giving before this... Uh, well, here's the <laughs> thing. It wasn't the best. The thing is, that's probably illegal. That's probably re regulated right. out of existence in Flint. That's, I mean, this, that's where this whole thing comes from. They're required yeah. to pay for this crap, and, and people are... You know, at risk of losing their children. I've heard about because, that. Yeah, this is this is all over the news. They're actually threatening people with ten, with kidnapping their services through CPS if they don't uh, if they don't pay their water bill, their right. city water bill. Because then that would be in a way detrimental to providing an environment for a child, and so therefore it allows excuses for this kidnapping agency of the state to just you know do what they do best, kidnapping this time. Uh, innocent children from their homes, from their parents, from their family. Yeah. Um, hmm. Oh, because the parents don't want to pay for, for shitty water, right? Right. We don't want to pay for this water that you are forcing us to, you know, to go into our, our house. It's not really water away. anymore. And it's point. not even water. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's basically just liquid lead. It's poison. <laughs> yeah, it's absolutely poison. Well, how often do we see stories like that of vaccines, public schools, children, I mean, uh, parents treating their children with banned medicinal compounds like THC. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Mm. And, and uh, so so Walmart and Pepsi are have joined into this this thing and, and you know of course this is this is PR, but the fact is they are donating water. The you know private industry and private people are donating water and they're actually, you know, working to help where the government has not only, you know, failed but actively worked to cause this situation. And, you know, and people are, the thing that really, really bugs the crap out of me is that people like Occupy, um, Occupy Wall Street idiots are posting stupid memes talking about how, okay, it, there's actually a meme that I saw. It just, it drove me crazy. It was like um, something about how you know, children in, in Flint, Michigan are dying, and we thought the Aurora shooter was bad. It's the Republicans that are terrorists because they want to shut down the EPA. First of all, the Republicans don't even want to shut down the EPA. Even though Republicans that claim they do are full of crap. They're bullshitting you people. They're not, they're wow. not even saying the truth. But this is the most retarded thing I've ever seen because... Flint, Michigan, a city run by Democrats, does this, uh, had basically poisons children with city water, and people want to talk about the Republicans and people that want to shut down the EPA as if they're the cause of this. What? Wow, wow, that's. What is wrong with your brain, you <laughs> morons? Political scapegoating there. Oh, it's, it's ridiculous. How, do, how does this even enter people's heads? How can you be that freaking stupid to make so, make a, such a ridiculous statement? And I don't even like the Republicans. All right. The Republicans are idiots, but how can you say something like that? At a time when the MP EPA is still in action, right? Yeah, and, and yeah, the EPA, there's nothing wrong with it. Nothing has even gone against the EPA. The EPA is fully functional right now. They have done nothing to, to prevent this. They, they can't. They can't blame their sacred cow. You know. Yeah. Like, uh, the government's a sacred cow. You know. There's got to be someone else who's kind of maybe pulling the strings in this area that way. Uh, the common denominator is never government. It's got to be something else. Yeah. All this private interest coming out there and, and, and oh my god, voluntary charity. Oh man, that's crazy stuff. Especially from Walmart. What is their incentive? What's their gain from here? Mm -hmm. um, so let's rely on the Environmental Protection Agency, the National Defense Authorization Act. Let's risk <laughs> for things yeah. that sound good. Right. Yeah, we'll we'll the Freedom back. Act. Because it's about freedom. <laughs> it makes us free. The Patriot Act. Man, yeah. Uh, 
the, at least the, the voluntary contribution of water out there is interesting. And that's, uh, that's great. That's great to show. Like, it's private businesses and interests and people out there donating and contributing to, to help one another outside of their own geographic region. You know, a lot of people talk about well, national defense or forms of security, and say, well, no one's going to donate anything, right? So, well, people do it all the time. And different places and parts of the world that don't even live or consider it, that will affect them in any way. Mm -hmm. um, but their self-interest probably just feels, well, that community's better off, you know, and that's my self-interest. Maybe one day my community gets hurt, they might uh, be in a better standing to uh, help take care of us the same. Right? Yeah. And, 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 and stuff like, even just, even if you take the cynical point of view, which it, which isn't even true, but if you take that cynical point of view that in a voluntary society, profit motive is key, and that's the only motive behind human action, even if you take that, that viewpoint, well, we have just shown right now that the profit motive had, you know, has driven this. And because Walmart and Pepsi have donated, you know, freely simply for a PR campaign. All right. You know, and, and that's in frankly, I don't even necessarily think that's true. I think there are probably people at Walmart and Pepsi that do have, you know, just a heart. genuine Yeah. <laughs> I mean, imagine that. People can work at corporations and still have a conscience. Now, that's not to say that the corporations themselves don't have completely, you know, um, government-created right. bonkers incentives. Mm -hmm. But, you know, uh, I, I actually, I don't take that much of a cynical view to say that this is purely an attempt at, you know, PR and profit. I'm, I'm sure, as far as the corporation is, 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 is concerned, mm -hmm. It basically is, but I, I I think there are probably people in there that that genuinely care about this. I think uh, Walmart might be a good discussion to kind of go over and uh, kind of analyze. So I guess completely removed from like people's emotions and stuff like that. Uh, like Bernie Sanders and a lot of people attack Walmart, and I mean I'm, I don't support uh, state uh, sponsored companies or like providing limited liabilities and stuff like that, uh, which is what uh, corporations are. Uh, but I guess there is something to kind of look at in which people say, well, they support the welfare state, but at the same time, they're also one of the largest uh, businesses that is uh, robbed the most in terms of taxes. Uh, so, of course, you know, where would they rather the money go to after they're being robbed? A huge substantial portion of amount of their profit. Uh, so that's something uh, to look into, I guess, and kind of analyze uh, that sort of stuff. Um, but yeah, it's, yeah, it's good to see businesses out there contributing, uh, whereas the local government there has failed <laughs> and can't function, it can't do anything. In the sense that these are government-backed corporations, it's hard to say that it's a, it's a success for private business, but I, I see where you're going with it. Yeah, <laughs> I mean, there, there is that factor, but I mean, this is, you know, you can't, you can't, I think it would be hard pressed to say that this donation is is a government, you know, sourced by government. You know? Right. So I mean, because it is, even if you look at it as you know just a PR campaign, that's still a private a, a private profit, you know, motive. Sure. So. Hmm. Well, on to a similar story. The Virginia board okay's permit for dewatering Virginia Power Powers coal ash ponds. Dominion, Virginia Power's plan to drain water from coal ash ponds into the James and Potomac Rivers won state approval Thursday, despite opposition from environmental groups and a state senator and the Maryland Department of Natural Resources. Um, so here we have a good example of a mega corporation using its financial prowess to influence um, government officials. I haven't looked into it far enough to see that uh, these state officials are actually receiving funds but with Dominion Power stronghold in Virginia, you have to imagine that the only reason, part of the major reason they're able to get this legislation through is because they are huge, a major corporation. So uh, actually, size. so I've only recently moved here and every, everywhere I've seen gets their power from Dominion. Is, is, right. Are they the only game in town? Or, or the are there player. Other, yes. Really, the they entire have, town. State grants and monopoly. Yes. Yeah, that's that's ridiculous. Right. I mean, it, you know, every uh, I think pretty much everywhere in America has you know uh, monopolies over for for power and for and uh, most annoying. Well, not most annoying, but very annoyingly, you know, like cable internet services or, or um, telecom services. Mm -hmm. But most of them are are very 
even within a city or within a, a county, at least chunked up, you know, to different corporations so that you can at least move within the city to a different spot, which right. is, isn't still is crap how they do it. But that as it, having the, having one company have dominion, so to speak, over the entire town is ridiculous. Yeah, uh, I think for like, I'm talking about like utilities or other kinds of stuff, like for a long time, AT&T's history and, and its upbringing and its uh, youth was uh, state sponsored and state granted monopolies in a lot of geographic regions for them to kind of spread all around. Isn't AT&T, weren't, weren't they originally Mama Bell? Uh, Mama Bell. I know that's, yeah. So Mama Bell um, was the, the uh, I, I'm not really clear on this, but, but as I understand it, Mama Bell was the, the state, um, uh, the state allowed monopoly over telecom, certain you know telephone services back in yes, the 70s or 80s or whatever, yeah. and um, they were broken up, in I believe the 70s into stuff like Bell South and such. But I think it was actually the the main thing ended up turning into AT and T. Hmm. But I'm I'm not really clear on that. Hmm. Well, um, an interesting port point on this article is that um, officials from the Department of Environmental Quality and uh, the Dominion Virginia Power assured the board that they would be filtering this water adequately. Um, it's funny, though, because in, this, uh, in their plan for implementation, there will be a 2,000-foot long stretch of the James River that in order for them to meet the uh, quality standards requirements, there will be um, a, a path for dilution. So basically, they won't meet the standards that they set forth for water purity until it's diluted in 2,000 feet of the James River. <laughs> wow. So that, that's why there are so many skeptics with this plan. Uh, we're assured it's safe, but there's a dilution path. <laughs> so, so when are they actually set to do this, do you know? I'm not sure, yeah. Well, we, we better do our walks and our... our uh, um, you know, excavating and, and, or not, that's not the wrong, wrong word, but <laughs> we need to do our James River adventures. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> before it's all yeah. gone and taken care of. Before it's us. brown. Yeah. <laughs> so hopefully in a free society, um, you would be able to test this water if it was somewhere near your land and actually charge whoever was responsible for the pollution. Um, Right, absolutely. Yeah. There's a lot of forensics now where you can trace uh, pollution particles and trace them all the way back to where they come from. Right. Here's, uh, the, here's the great thing. Even without specific personal property, um, you know, specific effect on, on your property close to the whatever, there is, in a, in a free society, you can ostracize that company. Right. You can't do that here. Right. And, and especially in, in, uh, in an apartment in... Um, in well, and this may actually not be the case in Virginia, but in um, uh, from what I'm used to, apartments are actually required. If you get an apartment, you're actually required by law to have electricity uh, with the local power company hmm. in that apartment, twenty four, you know, hmm. always piped in. So it has to be there under somebody's name. So and, and that may not be the case here, but. Hmm. Yeah, an organization and people talk about that's here to protect them from pollution itself is the largest polluter uh, mm -hmm. in the world. That organization that is just government. That was a question I had uh, in economics uh, today. We were talking about pollution. And, <laughs> and we were like, well, what do you want, do we want to do? A carbon tax? Do we just tax cars that are inefficient, creating a lot of pollution? And I was like, well, if we're really that concerned about pollution, then why don't we just get rid of that's why it's one of the largest uh, polluter in the world that is called government. And you kind of talk and laugh because everybody kind of stands with that government is the source of a lot of yeah. isn't there a, Isn't there a coal plant like just a few blocks away from the White House? And that's, that's just, that's been there since forever only for the fact that it's had, you know, that it's had its, its fingers in the government coffers for right. so long. That was something that uh, Biden had a problem with, I believe, in Delaware. And I believe that's where he was running from. Uh, for a while and people were he was going to pass like the Clean Water Bill Act or something like that and apparently uh, you know it would cost a lot of uh, money 
for people to kind of abide by that rule for local businesses. And of course, mm -hmm. the ones that, you know, I've been donating a lot to this campaign, stop by and visit and say, hey, you know, we, we know you got to pass this, called the Clean Water Bill Act. You know, you can't say no to that, right? Mm -hmm. <laughs> you lose a lot of your constituents uh, in the following. But, you know, I, you know so we, we'd appreciate an, uh, an exception, you know, maybe here and there. And you'll find at the back of every single legislative ruling that they could put out there in Congress, you flip to the back and every politician has their exceptions to this bill or, or law does not apply to. And those are their, their cronies, uh, corporatists, uh, the people who fund them, just like Dominion Power you mentioned. How do they get away with this? Well, uh, take a look who's kind of funding some of their campaigns, who's, who's, who's kind of funding some of the money out there. So they're promising us that uh, under their plan, the the toxins like lead, mercury, arsenic, or a few that were listed as uh, byproducts of this coal ash or in this coal ash. Um, so we're promised that it'll be diluted to the point where it won't harm us or the wildlife. But if it does, they're protected because they're doing just what they said they would do under legislation. Yeah. <laughs> government promises. Yeah, they always keep those. <laughs> <laughs> well, that's really the crux of it. I mean, even it really comes down to, and that's that's what a corporation is to begin with. And mm -hmm. it's it comes down to, oh, well, we're following the rules, and so it's not really our problem. If you have a problem with the rules, take it up with them because they wrote it. Right. And that's the point. It's to it's to so that the people that are, that are actually causing the issues don't have to deal with with any of the any of the consequences. It gets spread among the people. Right. Mm. I thought it was interesting. Uh, the group, uh, the Virginia group that made this decision finally, was only seven people. Uh, of the seven, only one there was only one dissenter, um, and there were over a hundred opponents, uh, citizens at the meeting, um, while over a thousand signed signatures to a. Uh, Stop the bill for the legislation. Well, it's all about mob of the minority there, huh? Right. So, so we can democracy at work. Yeah. <laughs> We're represented. All right. I guess um, in a free society, you know, they have real respect for private property. Mm -hmm. That'll limit a lot of these problems. You can't homestead uh, rivers here. So that's government property. You know, that's government land that they prevent you from homesteading. Whereas uh, if it was yours, you could prevent that kind of trespass uh, of aggression that pollutants do, right? Mm -hmm. Any kind of ruining and damaging your property. And here in the United States, of course, yeah, well, you know, you don't own the river. It's like, you know, and kind of these corporations will just, you know, we'll, we'll take the fine instead. It's better than having to change everything up. And in a free society, you know, they'd have to, you'll be liable to everyone who they've kind of violated. Yeah. I hope you'd be responsible for your actual actions and the consequences of your actions as opposed to... Um, <laughs> All right. what you've agreed upon. You know, we won't poison the river, but if it does get poisoned, hopefully you're still responsible to right. some extent. Yeah. <laughs> uh, in these sort of cases, yeah, CEOs won't, won't take the hit. They won't lose their jobs, won't lose any sleep, won't lose uh, their money, go to jail, anything. You know, they offset the cost of everyone else. Consumer prices going higher, employee salary going lower. The puppet sockets, uh, socks just take the hit themselves. Um, but yeah, that's uh, in terms of pollution, uh, you also find, you know, I guess pollution insurance will be your thing as well. Mm -hmm. So you find like pollution insurance companies will want to uh, prevent polluting companies from sitting up near a uh, community that has pollution insurance. So for example, uh, here's an open land space here and uh, this polluting company wants to come nearby there and kind of set up shop. Well, the insurance company will say, well, it's, well we kind of have to buy out that land for $100,000 less we allow this business to set up shop and then pollutes everywhere and then we have to pay out everyone in that community like a million dollars or something like that. Whatever we kind of guarantee that, you know, would keep you safe. Uh, so there's a lot of ways that the market kind of can resolve a lot of these issues and problems. And, but... You know, that's, that's the, uh, you know, a lot of people, some people worry on both sides of the issues. Well, will corporations exist without government? And the answer is yes and no. The, the corporate entity itself is a government construct. So right. yeah, as far as that's concerned, no. But will there be a limited liability structure in a free society? And I'm, I'm sure there, there will be. And, and one of the examples would be, like, like you say, an in, in, in insurance uh, paradigm where they, they have this, okay, you know, we, we have signed this, this with the, the community, you know, and everybody has to be involved, but this is, you know, 
we or or one company has agreed to take the liability for you know another company, mm -hmm. and if you and if you prove yourself to be an egregious violator of of this or that, then your rates are gonna be very prohibitive, right? And you're not going to be you're going to be pretty much run out of business, and um or at the very least you're going to be paying essentially the same amount <coughs> as you would be if, if you weren't limited. Or the insurance company just says, that's too much of a risk for us to even want to cover. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Uh, whereas government guarantees limited liability all around for everyone. Right. I would hope so. This might be too extensive of a topic to cover, but could pollution eventually end up violating the NAP? Yeah, pollution is a form Absolutely. of aggression. Mm -hmm. So it's an aggression on your property. Uh, so it's uh, just damaging your property, right? And so much so, like throwing a rock through your window damages. Uh, there are window. arguments mm -hmm. about that. So um, one of the one of the things that have been shown to be like it, like one of the worst things in the world is is just you know lighting fires in in your fireplace. So when you actually have a fire in your fireplace, you're spreading some of the 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 worst uh, air pollutants as far as um, as uh, respiratory health to your entire neighborhood. And in, in a situation like that, how much of a violation is, is that? Just lighting a fire in your fireplace? Uh, yeah, I mean, that, that would still be a violation. I remember hearing about this old story about this woman who was like, just hanging her clothes out there in a clothesline next to a railroad track that kind of set up a shop. And every once in a while, this railroad or this train will come by and a plume of smoke will come by and just land on her field. And a long time ago, there was a little bit kind of research of private property, and she, she won the case. And you know they had to change some stuff about them, and because otherwise they'll keep continue to get sued. Um, so yeah, I mean, there'll be real respect for that, and they'll find it's more cost uh, you know prohibitive to continue that kind of form and trying to find other ways instead to go around it, or maybe it's just not worth it, right? Uh, right now, a lot of the fuel or types of uh, uh, ways that we run this world are kind of incentivized by government and preventing a lot of uh, market research and developing other kinds of uh, energy uh, sustainability in terms of um, restricting IP, right? In terms of uh, patents and stuff like this, We're ruining creativity or, right? For example, it's difficult, it's uh, legal in uh, Maryland to collect rainwater, right? There's, there's a lot of things that kind of prevent people from like harnessing the energy around them. Um, and of course, there's the unseen, the things that can't get built because uh, government controls the roads, if you control the roads, you control the infrastructure, you control the kind of technology that's allowed on those roads, mm -hmm. and of course the fuels that kind of runs those technology and on those roads. So, yeah, there's a lot of things that, uh, that holds us back <laughs> in terms of that. Well, just on that level, you know, um, the, the technological um, you know, innovations that, that can be brought forward, even to solve situations like you know, a, a smoky fireplace, uh, my my car actually has an inbuilt allergen filter that I didn't you know I didn't even I didn't order it specifically on the car it came with the car so I can and you know I have I personally have you know respiratory issues I have I have allergies and I can turn on the allergy filter hmm. and it it's it I should probably do that more often because Richmond's a little bit, <laughs> pretty polluted city <laughs> what are you talking about. <laughs> But uh, there's, we've got Philip Morris here, man. Everybody smokes. <laughs> well, pretty soon there'll be puffing greens over there. Yeah. <laughs> they're, uh, they're ready to roll out those cannabis so cigarettes. <laughs> I don't look forward to it. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't look forward to any uh, legalization or decriminalization or any of that stuff. Right. Yeah, yeah. I, I agree. I agree. Phil, one of the one of the biggest <laughs> things that Philip Morris is against is stuff like craft beers and. Um, they don't want competition against their vice. Right. Yeah, that's the same reason why... Uh, and there will be craft marijuana because marijuana has a such a thriving... Uh, I, excuse me, I hate that term marijuana. Not, not because... Cannabis. It's, yeah, yes. cannabis has, a, has such a thriving craft culture. Um, it's, you know, it rivals beer despite being illegal. Right. So once it's inevitably legalized everywhere, um, that will... As long as the government doesn't get its... But even if it does, even if it does, it's like moonshine. Nobody can stop it. You know, and even moonshine was eventually, you know, they, they, they had the pressure on them to allow stuff like moonshine. A uh, good movie you should probably watch would be Lawless. Have you seen that? It takes place in Franklin County in Virginia. Virginia has a rich history in moonshine and combating against uh, prohibition. Right. Uh, it's got uh, Bane in it. 
Are you too? <laughs> I have. Let me be straight. Shia LaBeouf. Yeah. That was a good movie. Actual cannibal. Shia right. LaBeouf. Speaking of uh, prohibition and combating cops, uh, so let's let's go into the third topic here, it's, which is poking bears. Uh, so there's a lot of people who've, who've been doing this for a long time, and I've seen all kinds of people doing it. Uh, I guess my time, just uh, going back to like 2006, I've seen Ancoms doing this sort of thing and uh, trying to get their merit badges of arrests by trying to martyr themselves, trying to confine themselves into a smaller cage by poking the bear, by antagonizing police extortionists, monsters, right? People, murderers, <laughs> who, who, whose vocation is to harm and hurt people. And so there have been, as a result, uh, what people sometimes think, well, this is the kind of activism, the, the considerate activism in terms of uh, propelling or uh, pushing forward uh, towards some kind of good or, or change. And I have never, never seen any of this stuff take place. Uh, I've always seen people continue to get arrested, continue to put themselves in a smaller cage. We were already in a cage to begin with in terms of the tax farms. And then there's also a lot of pressure that occurs. So if you don't show up to this protest and try to get yourself arrested, and a lot of parents can't um, can deal with that kind of pressure anymore. Now, now some of these people have kids now. And so then they can't fathom them being thrown away and locked up in a cage for a couple of months, uh, you know, for, for something that uh, you know, people would just kind of will forget all the, already. And so their kids will be without parents just for a little while longer. Uh, so the kind of uh, things that people do in terms of uh, poking the bear uh, is an endless thing and just seems to be uh, trying to martyr themselves for a senseless cause in which, you know, there's no room for that. We're all already suffering. There's no need for voluntary martyrdom. Um, as a result, and especially, I think you brought up a good point. Troy says, "Like, look, there's already enough evidence, tons and tons and tons of evidence to show the state <laughs> uh, being uh, shown as the the person who's victimizing masses and masses amount of people. Uh, photos, videos. The United States government has murdered over 30 million people in the 20th century. Please, please, please. We have enough videos of cops shooting people. Do not make yourself one of those people, please. All right. <laughs> well, the, uh, so this is. I think this is really something that speaks to vanity, and 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 you know, people like to make excuses that this type of activism, you know, it gets the word out, and and it. it you know, provokes outrage among among the populace, but it, it really doesn't. It provokes slacktivism, and that's it. Mm -hmm. And nothing ever comes of it. And it's it's at its core, it's really an exercise in vanity, and that's all it is. So you want your you want your activism badge of oh, I I was oppressed by the the police by you know just exercising my rights, and it's like so what. Right, and perhaps yeah. at its best, you're promoting mimicry, saying right. white people getting thrown yeah, well, cages. Well, a lot of people, uh, I think a lot of this is 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 brought forth. People think that they're going to be saved by you know mass call-ins and whatnot because the, these things have been relatively successful for people like Adam Kokesh and 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 Derek uh, Freeman or um, I think that's his name. Yeah, and but. You're not as popular as they are. For everyone else? Nobody knows who you are. Everybody knows who Adam Kokesh is. That's why he can provoke these mass call-in campaigns. That's why he can can make make it this he can make this very difficult for for the people that are holding them, or, or very much a hassle at the minimum. And even despite that, he was stuck in a cage for how many for quite months? a long time. Yeah. How much freedom can you spread when you're in a cage? Yeah, and, and, and he draws that. What really you don't know anybody. You don't have you know national uh, national reach. How much do you think you're going to be protected against that? How much of a hassle do you think that you're going to be able to make for these people? None. You're going to be involved. You're going to be behind bars. You're going right. to be thrown in quick. In they were going to forget about you. Right. Trying yeah. to kind of follow in that footstep or kind of model after that kind of behavior. And all, again, all that amount of time and resources is going to be taken away from you that could be better invested in towards your community or building a tribe that's supposed to replace in towards the transition to a free society. Mm -hmm. uh, to abolish the state and here's a tribe that's going to, to bring forth a world of a peaceful generation of, of, of humanity. 
Uh, but no, the time's just uh, months away and then rotting away in a cage. Uh, money and resources uh, spent on trying to get yourself a lawyer, trying to, uh, you know, trying, trying to win this appeal. Mm -hmm. uh, again, resources misdirected where they should be better allocated towards the tribe itself. Uh, remember, pe people forget the, the agorism is the art of not getting caught. Right, agorism kind of denoting that the state robs so much of you from you already. They rob so much time, they rob so much money, they rob so much from you. I mean, you go to the top from uh, all the different types of stop signs that you, that you go at and you add it up, it's like that. Those are, those are days. You know, we add up those seconds and, and, and those uh, inconvenience. Uh, yeah, they, they rob so much. Don't give the, the state any more of your time uh, than you much unless there's a gun pointing at you and live your life as free as you can aside from that. Uh, don't well, put yourself. Don't. This is uh, and being in a war, right? This is a war. The state that what that the state has brought upon us. Uh, don't volunteer to be a prisoner of war. <laughs> well, well, to address your your you know agorism as as the the art of not being caught. There actually are two two different uh, views of agorism, and and that's one. And, and the other one, which is um, and this I uh, have you heard of uh, Taran Lupo? Taron Lupin? Yeah. Yes. Okay, he does so, uh, Savannah Pirates books. Right. Yeah. He he he's a novelist. I I I I'm not really a novel reader, so I haven't read much of his stories. But I've I've read some of his nonfiction. So he has a you know how to make a a living um, as an agorist or something like that, and uh, how to like like ways to hide your stash. I have and some of his so books like, actually. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But he, he's really cool, and and that's you know he sort of displayed he, he sort of uh, goes through this how there are two kind of two different. Um, Approaches to agorism, and one is is that you know not getting caught right. doing it under the radar, and but another one and that is also still a you know um, a valid view of how it is, is public agorism you know and not specifically not poking the bear but being upfront about you know you know we are in a community we are 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 selling our goods and we're not we're not going to be doing this under your slave system. We are doing this through free voluntary action, and we're not hiding about it. Right, no, that's true, and I will, I will consider that as a living your life as if you're already free, right? Because you kind of have to balance the two, right? We can't get too much stressed out with, with, with the war that's going out there. You also kind of have to live. You also kind of have to show what a uh, free society would look like in your community, right? So for me, in that case, that includes running a lot of stop signs and running through a lot of lights and breaking <laughs> as many laws as I can to get away with, right? Uh, living as I would if I was already free without these uh, prison rules and constraints and shackles. Uh, in terms of uh, living uh, publicly, yeah, all the time, absolutely. I would not call that though civil disobedience, because civil disobedience yeah, denotes yeah. that there is someone in your life that you have given power to and a position for you to disobey, mm -hmm. right? <laughs> and that for, for most people who do that, they already have knowledge that the state has this power and you're disobeying them. Uh, at some point, you kind of have to kind of grow out of that face. You know, at some point when you're adults, you know, you're, you're never, when you disagree with your pa parents or, or you're not disobeying them, they don't have that kind of control of power over you, right? It's an equal share power relationship. Well, active, active civil disobedience is by definition, I mean, it's absolutely an exercise in vanity. Right. You know, it, especially with, you know, with with the racking a shotgun in Freedom Square, you know, Adam Cook, that was absolutely nothing but vanity. Right. And he admitted it. He said, you know, I did this to tell the world that I am not afraid. It's a, what the hell do you have to prove? Why do you have to prove that? You so you just went to jail for however many months because you don't want people to think you're a pussy. Yeah, I heard Congratulations. Was something that, well, I'm going to contest it on constitutional grounds, uh, Second Amendment stuff. Uh, that's another problem I find with then a lot of this. Then you pled out. Yeah, right. You pled out. That's another problem I find with a lot of this stuff because then now you're promoting the lie that you have constitutional rights. You're promoting the lie and tricking and misleading people that you have this imaginary rights that's going to protect you from uh, from these police extortions, from, from this criminal grant gang called the state, which doesn't exist. It's a horrible thing to do to people, to mislead them, to lie them, and to think that they're protected in some sort of way. There are no laws here. There are prison rules. You're a prisoner uh, towards the fantasy of the idea that other people uh, can decide what you can and cannot do with your property or your body. Uh, with people who are stuck with that, then those are slaves. But in that regard, I find a lot of people who are poking the bear always advocating that. Well, it's my first uh, amendment right. Well, you know, it's my second constitution. Like, look, when people see this kind of reporting and see you doing this, it's like you're, you're continuing that propaganda. 
you're not um, ex you're not expounding the principles of liberty. You're not really giving anybody a model to go off of. The best outcome I've ever seen from a situation like this is people advocating for uh, police accountability. And uh, we don't want the police to be... <laughs> right. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> we want to abolish them. Yes, we want them gone. Yeah, we've, we, we, we've put the cameras on their vests. And you know what? It doesn't do anything. Either they can turn them off or they just don't... Like in the situation in Virginia, they don't have to... It's their prerogative on whether or not they want to enter that into evidence. It's not yours. Right. Yeah, a, a police accountability to notice that. I want to be, uh, when I am being threatened to be kidnapped, I want to be treated nicely. Mm -hmm. And that's what that means. Uh, you know, when, when you're uh, assaulting me and hurting me, I want to do it in a humane way, right? Mm -hmm. It's like, it's okay if I'm in a cage, just don't spray me with the water, please. Right. <laughs> you know, and everyone here knows that this accountability is at the discretion of the... Of course it right. is. Right. It right. always will be. That's, I mean, that's what happens when you have a monopoly on authority. I mean, it, it, what would you expect? Right. Uh, police accountability then seems kind of like a fetish advocation that, you know, uh, instead of hitting me with that particular whip, you know, with a softer one. Yeah. <laughs> Hit me with the writing crop, not with yeah. the whip. Or at least show me the abuse. Right. <laughs> have a recorder so I can watch him. I go, oh. <laughs> So yeah, um, in terms of, yeah, there's, there's a lot of reason why it's, it's not good activism in that sense uh, and some of the lies that it promotes and that's all I've ever seen in that regard. Mm. Um, so let's, let's talk about some alternatives out there that people can do in better their time. Uh, the first one, of course, I put out there is spreading anarchy, you know, going out there in your community and actually talking about the truth. You know, you have no rights. Right. Uh, talking about the moral uh, principles that we already share, you know, meeting out and creating this, this community and that tribe and, and spend your time. Um, for that, building that, uh, getting yourself locked up in a cage, you know, uh, I, I can't imagine what I would do if I got myself in a cage for like over a year or something like that. That's, that's a lot of time. I, I can't take that back. Um, and for what, for, I don't know, for, for attention? Uh, it's like, I, I can't get, that's, that's a long time. That, but, but instead, if you um, express the ideas of anarchy and liberty to somebody, uh, once they actually fully understand that, if they ever were to go on and uh, reproduce offspring, they would pass on these right. nonviolent principles onto their children, who would be raised into healthy adults without brain damage from spanking and yelling right. and all the abuses. Well, that's that's a that's the uh, probably the most important long term approach, long term strategy is peaceful parenting. Right. Perhaps, but I will give uh, credence to the individual and say that education is also probably the most important thing that uh, an individual could be exposed to. Um, a real education in which you're able to critically analyze thinking itself so that you can go out into the world and figure out education, not schooling. Exactly. Right. <laughs> it's a multi-strategy uh, front that we put out there. Yeah, peaceful parenting being a great big part of that. Agorism as well. Um, another part, uh, I guess, some people want to try to do other attempts of trying to show the police state instead of trying to get yourself kidnapped uh, would be you could do jury notification outreach, not necessarily in front of a courthouse, uh, but you could do it at a local college campus. People are walking there all the time. You set up a table and have a sign that says, uh, ask me how to end the war on, you know, take out drugs, cross it out, and put people. Right, and just having these conversations, you know, ask them to say, "Hey, would you take a, a pledge um, to talk to two or three of your friends?" I say, "Yeah, you know what, I will." You know, if, if I ever go, if I ever am coerced to be kidnapped to go to a jury trial, oh uh, yeah, no victim, no crime. Well, I don't, I don't, I don't necessarily think doing that on the on the steps of the courthouse is, is poking the bear. Um, right, I wouldn't say, right, I'm, yeah. you use the discretion, right? right. Uh, I, I, don't do it in front of their, the very front doors, for example, you know, yeah. there's, there's areas in which the boundaries where they can't get you, and that would be, you know, maybe the sidewalk, right? Yeah. But, um, but that's very much, I, that is very much just a, a, a difference between direct, immediate strategy and long-term strategy, because college students can't be pegged for jury duty. So they're not going to be, they're not going to deal with that for multiple years. So you're looking when you're when you're uh, targeting college students with uh, student outreach for jury nullification, you're looking you know five, six, seven years, maybe even more down the line for when they might be pegged in the future, which is great. I mean it, that's and it, it's necessary, but when you when you um you know flyer pass out flyers 
out in front of the courthouse, you're targeting jurors, current jurors. You you are looking for du- you know direct results and or possible direct results in an immediate case, and and this becomes. Uh, very important for you know for people who have their lives on the lines right now right and it's it, it, it may be to a certain extent you know um, putting your own safety on at risk for you know and, and it, uh, maybe unnecessarily but I think it is it's it's an important strategy and it's it's certainly a valid one it's what helped uh, bring down prohibition Right. Uh, there's a story of which uh, <laughs> this jury were in a room with the evidence of the alcohol, and they're saying, well, this is what the guy was drinking. And it's like, well, how do we tell it's really alcohol? And, and every- <laughs> everybody is drinking, and there's nothing left. It's like, well, we don't see any evidence. <laughs> Not guilty. <laughs> like, oh, that's my favorite brand. I think we're going to have to test this. <laughs> right? we got to make sure that it's fine quality here. Um, yeah, absolutely. Um, I, I, I say a lot of uh, the college students are good, and not so much that maybe perhaps that they won't have access to do that soon, but they have their parents that they can talk to, right? Uh, I like, like piece of parenting, like targeting um, in, in our target audience. Uh, yeah, a lot of these people are also older brothers and sisters, and sometimes they take, there's like the secondary parent uh, caretaker towards their younger siblings, right? It's like, look, I just came across information, mom. It's like, what do, you, what do you think? Why don't, why don't we just stop doing this, right? Mm-hmm. I remember when you did it to me, I didn't particularly like it, and here's some evidence, and I would say they have a more closer say to reach out to the parents than the younger siblings would, uh, and in a way, it would be the sons and daughters that reach out to the mothers and fathers in kind of approaching a lot of this information. Um, I noticed the flash is kind of lighting there right now. Uh, so let's, let me take a, a second here, replace the battery, be right back. So yeah, so, so another alternative would be, yeah, Building the tribe, you know, focus your attention to building that sort of stuff. Uh, get the community to understand what's going on in terms of liberty in which you're mentioning. A lot of people who are watching a lot of these uh, particular videos in which you're getting yourself uh, further kidnapped by the state have no idea what's going on. And some of these antics are just sometimes trying to show like, well, see, the cops are bad. And no, people already know the cops are bad. Uh, and trying to do these kind of um, uh, pranks is to uh, show, uh, like, like one that came across uh, trying to run away from cops. Uh, and trying to see if the cop can chase after him. It's like, hey, I was just taking a job. I was trying to run, you know, trying to do those spontaneous runs for them. Uh, it's like, look, yeah, you're, that's stupid. I mean, you're gonna get hurt. You're gonna get hurt. Uh, we don't want to be in a community that worries all, all the time about each other, whether or not we're gonna get kidnapped all the time. And then the rest, most of our members are out there rotting in a cage, and, uh, and the whole thing kind of falls apart because of that. Um, yeah, that's not a good model to kind of follow through with. Um, Another thing, I guess, if you're really that concerned about uh, police extortion, is to create a workshop with your neighborhood, right? We do a workshop, a community workshop, and tell people how to uh, evade police extortions, how to survive those encounters if uh, you happen to be caught, uh, not purposefully, not because you're trying to provoke it, for example, like uh, traffic stop, for example, or things to kind of prevent traffic stop. You know, make sure you do your, you look around around your car, things that you would have to say. Uh, in terms of response, you know, never consent to a church search, for example. Uh, it's a lot of things a lot of people don't know. Never say a word to police. Right. Unfortunately, <laughs> in that, sec- in that uh, circumstance, what? I have heard you do have to declare your Fifth Amendment right. Yeah, yeah. well, actually, so so the uh, the Supreme Court actually declared that if, if you don't say, if you claim your Fifth Amendment right without actually claiming your Fifth Amendment right, they can take that <laughs> as a, uh, get a sign of guilt. And or is like probably claiming your Fifth Amendment right? You mean? No, not cl- like being silent to the police. Like right. Well, they're they're, they're already going to view you as being guilty. Yeah, you can't be silent to the police, and that was actually proven with uh, with Amanda Billy Rock. She was silent to the police, and they they just dropped the curve uh, with it, and they they pegged her with um, they extorted her, um, and she ended up. I think that's I, I think that actually it actually ended up driving her down to Acapulco because you know she, it, she was so upset about that. Fourth but, most dangerous city in the world, right? Yeah. To that world. <laughs> yeah. Well, they, they uh, both uh, she and um, I think it's Pete Iyer that she's she's been working with lately. Uh, both of them returned to New Hampshire, but uh, so they didn't stay in Acapulco very long. Yeah. Which. 
but uh, but no, she was she was actually in a situation where she was pulled over, and she just went cold, you know, cold fish at him. She just didn't say anything, and they charged her, you know, for drunk driving and hmm. and and stuff that they didn't even there was no not even any indication of. I, I think they like tried to peg a open bottle charge or something ridiculous like that on her. It was it was just yeah. So so you you do have to. Uh, one of my favorite examples is is there is a guy that does specifically say he you know he's like no you you don't just shut up you say specifically I don't answer questions and that's the only thing you say and um, I I think there's there's still serious risks with that approach too but it's it's probably the closest um, to to what you you want to do in that situation you say okay. Here's my stuff. I don't. I don't answer questions because if you say if, if you say a lot um, to the cops, they can make claims like, "Oh, you he was slurring his speech," or right. something like so that. So you don't want to truly remain silent. You just don't want to give information. Right. <laughs> right. All the information they're going to use is against you, in which right. whatever you you kind of spiel. Uh, and, and always have your you know don't open your window. Don't open your window. Crack your window enough to give them the documents and to take whatever you know they. They like to have that really thick little metal thing that they put their their ticket on, so you have to have some space. Have just enough space for that, you know. You then they'll be a uh, full because they claim the smell, which right. is not even valid. This the, having a having the claim of smell is not a valid reason to search your car. You can't really reasons. smell alcohol either. Yeah. Um, well, but it's I'll, the smell of weed. Or the smell of weed. Uh, but a lot of them will always just try to find excuses uh, just to do that. Uh, so we'll try to bring you know the dog out and see you know uh, what's going on here. And of course, the dog can alert one command. Um, so yeah, this uh, the best thing to do is just then to try to evade them as much as you can. Uh, these are not positions you ever want to be involved in in the first place. But at least do a workshop on you know survival, evasion, resistance, and escape from those kind of scenarios. Um, that'll be a good topic to do for News from Underground and kind of kind of go over a lot of that stuff. We did one, I, uh, I look forward to that. I think a year ago with Panzer here. It was a lot of fun. And yeah, so that's, that's it. I guess in terms of like, what do you do with police extortionists? You know, you handle them the way you do with bears, you know, don't go near them. <laughs> um, focus on everyone else. That's not a police extortion. That's not a murderous, violent sociopath. I would say focus on building the tribe and that's, uh, 99% of the community there are not violent uh, sociopaths in terms of the commies nearby or police extortionists or politicians. So that's everyone else. Focus on that, build that up, unite the other prisoners, and then eventually contend with the wardens of your cages. And by that time, you already outnumber them. And the next thing to do is a social ostracism. Yeah, done, clear, already. You know, by that time, they're saying, well, shit, you know, my friend, my family, my community, they're part of uh, you know, this liberate community. Uh, you know, what the hell have I been doing? And then slowly they'll just kind of let go of themselves unless they want to be part of uh, the future of civilization, part of the city. Um, and then to make amends for all the wrongs that they've done <laughs> to other people that they've victimized. Uh, it's like um, like being a doctor. You know, some people need a lot of work, and this, this is a battlefield, and you're doing triage. It's like you know, work on everyone else, which uh, you can have this you know great foundational uh, philosophical conversation with. Uh, but the police extortion, that's 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 a, a lot of time. That's in terms of efficiency. That's those are days, for example. Days and, and times of hours that could better be spent efficiently talking to everyone else and having a better measure of success uh, and an outcome with that. Okay. Well, and I, I just wanted to so, so you have the poking bear um, analogy, it, it, but even one just closer to home. If you see a clear gangbanger across the street, you know, do you walk up to him, start slinging insults, and say, hey, hey, asshole, I got my rights? Yeah. <laughs> no, because you're gonna get shot. What's that you said? <laughs> yeah. What What do you think these people in black suits and shiny badges are? They're gang members. That's all they are. They're gang members with paperwork. Proving right. a point that's been proven time and time again. Yeah. So with that, uh, hopefully you guys uh, took something away from our discussion with with all these topics and particularly poking bears. If you guys have any comments or questions or uh, any kind of um, I guess help in any kind of situation like where you're from or what kind of activism, activism you can do, um, you know, put a comment down there below or send us a message at info at liberatereva.com. This is Cal Molone, Isaac Markison, and Bill Pollard. See you guys at the Victor Party. Take good care.
reflect agony of dreams that were shattered. It never mattered to the so-called general public about my nation's situation and how we rise above it and they love it. When we self-destruct and kill a home and the greater responsibility, yes, it's still our own. We should know by now that the system is designed for our demise. If we arrive, we'll be left behind. The dollar signs rule. But what about the fool who falls victim to the material world?